Welcome to you all, Berkeley students, global students in Barcelona, Sao Paulo, Kiev, Salvador, Tunis, Lisbon, Oslo, Tehran, Johannesburg, or wherever else you may be. This is an experimental course called Public Sociology Live. A collaboration between the International Sociological Association, University of California, Berkeley, and universities and sociological associations around the world. I'm Michael Bourvoy, President of the International Sociological Association, and I will be teaching this course with my colleague Lali Bibahanian. She's right here next to me, <laughs> and she will be moderating the class today. Berkeley's Educational Technolo Technology Services will be helping us operate the sophisticated equipment in this newly designed room that we have here. This indeed is going to be an amazing experiment with all this newfangled technology. But as I shall explain, this course will involve far more than the people in this room. We form but one node in a widely flung and global net as you will see, this is indeed very much an experiment. But first let me tell you what motivates this course. It's very simple. The world is in a mess. Today is January 25th, and as I speak, Tahrir Square in Cairo is teeming with people celebrating the anniversary of the so-called January Revolution that overthrew the Mubarak dictatorship. Many will be protesting tonight that the revolution was actually hijacked by the military, that it was more like a military coup. Well, this last year, hopes like these have been dashed, but they have not been destroyed. The global movement Egypt inspired continues despite setbacks. We've seen protests sweep across the Arab world through Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and as I speak, courageous people are sacrificing their lives in Syria in a costly war against the brutal dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad. We have seen protests of the indignados spreading across Europe against bankrupt states seeking to impose fiscal austerity on desperate populations. We have seen protests in India around corruption or land expropriation. Indeed, similar protests can also be found in China, where the real story increasingly lies in the destruction of rural communities through land speculation and expropriation. In Latin America, economic decline in the 1990s generated all manner of social movements, many of them calling for different forms of participatory democracy. Social movements that have indeed intensified over the last year, in Chile for example, there has been a massive uprising of students against the commercialization of higher education. Moving to another continent, Africa, we find in South Africa, where inequality seems to gallop ahead, there have been bitter protests around inadequate service delivery. In the Philippines, where just over a month ago, 1,200 people died in a typhoon, public opinion increasingly views these disasters as unnatural, the product of Yes, global warming. In Japan, in Fukushima, following what everyone knows to be an unnatural disaster, there is an expanding opposition to nuclear power. And yes, even in the United States, there's a movement. They call it the Occupy Movement, focused its attention on the 1% whose ever-increasing wealth comes at the expense of the 99%. The US state, and of course, the U.S. state inspired this movement. The U.S. state bailed out the banks to save the rule of finance capital. We can call it socialism for the bankers. The bankers are banking on socialism. While each movement, and I could go on and on, while each movement has its own natural, national character and object, the wave of movements that we have observed over this last year has a global character. In one way or another, they all protest the collusion of state and market at the expense of society. Indeed, there seems to be no limit to the invasion of the market, no place that is sacred, no entity free of commodification. 
Indeed, across the world, the public university itself is being overrun by market pressures that show themselves up in your, yes, your increased, Devine? Tuition fees. Tuition fees. But also in cost cutting that leads to the degradation of your education. education. <laughs> Indeed. The university comes to look ever more like a private business <laughs> with high paid managers in relentless pursuit of more and richer clients. They are foreign students. The university itself, the university itself becomes a contested terrain. And the question is this, will it side with the market and the state or with social movements emanating from society? And within the university, where does sociology stand? And within society, ever threatened by state and market, what direction does sociology face? Will it bury its head in the mounting rubble? Sociology, I believe, has always turned its head against the unregulated market and the despotic state. Starting indeed from Marx and Weber and Durkheim, familiar figures to you around this table, including even Talcott Parsons, who perhaps a little less familiar to you, an icon of US sociology of the 1950s. Yes, and then we can think of dependency theory and feminism and post-colonialism. They're all unequivocal in their criticism of market fundamentalism. But today, today, how should we constitute sociology? How should we constitute a sociology for a world careering towards its own self-made disaster. And here I want to recall the ideas and words of C. Wright Mills, the great maverick of US sociology, who defined the sociological imagination as what? The turning of personal troubles, anybody know, into Public issues. What did you say? It's a public issue. It's public issues. Very good, Kaylee. <laughs> yes. When facing unemployment or land expropriation, we get so caught up in our own troubles that we are often blind to the broader forces at work, namely unregulated labor markets, unregulated land markets, unregulated money markets, and now we have unregulated knowledge markets. Aided, all of them aided and abetted by the states, by nation states. As sociologists, we study, investigate, research these broader forces that shape our personal troubles. But how do we make those forces the object of public debate? How do we make them public issues? This is the task of public sociology convincing people that what they personally experience as individuals is the product of broader forces that can potentially be brought under human control. Convincing them, for example, as my colleague Ali Hoschild has tried to do, that the gender division of labor and family is not only a product of power-hungry men, and though we do have power-hungry men, there are a lot of them around, but is the product of the way society organizes careers. So that careers are essentially for individuals dependent upon somebody at home looking after the family. Or, to give another example, my teacher William Julius Wilson tried to show that class is more important than race in the determination of African American poverty. Or again, Pierre Bourdieu the great French sociologist, trying to show that the maintenance of class domination works through education and the inheritance of cultural resources, or what he called cultural capital. These are visions of the macro forces that shape our individual lives. Sometimes those forces actually are invisible. And so sociologists are important in making them visible. So again, for example, South African sociologist Eddie Webster trying to show that trade unions rooted in communities could be a powerful weapon against South African apartheid. And I could go on and give you many more examples. But as we shall see, each country has its own public sociology. 
but let us not move too quickly into the quicksand of wider society. Let us not forget that as fully-fledged sociologists, we all share one public. That public is our students. They are our first public. They are a captured public. You have to sit here and pretend at least to listen to me. Yes, and I can actually impose examinations on you insofar as you follow the normal routines, you will actually learn something. You are forced to absorb some sociology. You are indeed a captured public. And moreover, students, you, as students, you have your own publics. In bringing sociology to you, to students, teachers of sociology are bringing sociology to the wider community. So before I go any further, let me introduce the audience watching this video to the students of this class because they are going to be active participants. Let me introduce the students of this class and the publics they represent. And so we will perhaps go round the room and perhaps we'll start with you, Kaylee. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Kaylee. Um, I'm interested in food as it intersects with, intersects with social movements, gender and sustainability. Um, the publics I'm most connected to are food justice activists and communities in Oakland. Hi everyone, my name is Veen. I'm originally from Jamaica. I was educated in the United States. I'm connected to the Caribbean public and um, the general public of advocates and scholars wanting to increase access to higher education. Hello everybody, my name is Diana Rios. I am Latina with Mexican roots. I will be studying in India next fall. Um, I am interested in health disparities among minority groups. Mm -hmm. I am Miriam Azari Gonzalez. I was born and raised in Southern California. Um, I identify with first generation college students, particularly with Mexican Americans, and increasing access to better education for low income families. Hi everyone, my name is Min Nguyen. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. I study international relations and global poverty studies, and I strongly identify with publics that lack challenges, um, that face challenges in education. Hi, my name is Madame Sørensen. I'm from Norway. Uh, I guess I identify with Scandinavians, students, climate activists, and well, the Facebook generation. Hi, I'm Dominika. I was born in Norway, raised in Poland, but now I live in the Netherlands. I feel cosmopolitan, um, and I see connection with individuals rather than with groups or publics. Hello, my name is Ryan Kwok, and I was born and raised in California. I'm interested in minority advocacy, as well as groups involved in human rights violations at both the national and international level. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm from a small shrinking city in upstate New York, and I'm connected to the queer community as well as activists and critically minded spaces on campus. Hi, I'm Vidya, a very local student who embarked on a year of world travels. I don't really identify too strongly with one, any one public, though I feel the most kinship with intellectuals and humans in general. Hi, my name is Micah. I grew up in Kansas City in a working class family. I have traveled, worked, or am otherwise connected to publics in Ecuador, India, Thailand, Costa Rica, Belize, Haiti, Iceland, Hungary, and Norway. Hi, Ida. <laughs> I'm Parajat, born and raised in the Bay Area, and I'm very interested in economic sociology. In terms of publics, I connect with students, <coughs> soccer players, and those curious and interested in the world around them. How you doing? My name is Raymond. Uh, I'm a sociology major uh, coming from a background of both sociology and biblical studies. Uh, because of that, I feel most aligned with the Protestant Christian communities um, along with uh, the minority groups, specifically working class ethnic groups, including both Filipino Americans and Mexican Americans. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Pergara. I was born in San Diego. I connect mostly with marginalized communities in general. 
Hi, my name is David Torres. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and I identify with minorities and lower class urban youth. <coughs> my name is Julian Martinez. I'm from Calexico, California, a small town on the border of the eastern side of California, and I have connections with the Latino community. Michael, back up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Naomi Sanikers. I was raised in Transfronteriza. It's U.S. citizens living in Mexico who migrate between two cultures, two languages, and two nations every day. The publics I identify with are immigrants and English as a second language students, queer, Latina, and former, former homeless youth in the U.S. Hi, my name is Michelle Kolpak. I grew up in Seattle's activist communities focused on global social justice. Currently, I feel particularly <coughs> connected to the Occupy movement as well as the demands for social change in Kenya. So I'm Lale. I'm originally from Iran, and I feel definitely connected to Middle Eastern and Muslim uh, publics, especially those who live here in the U.S. And I, like Michelle, also feel very invested in the development of the publics being constituted by the Occupy movement here in the U.S. as well. Good. So, you see, this is a very cosmopolitan group of students, perhaps uh, a result of the patterns of migration to California and globalization more generally. Also, students connected to many of the movements that we've been, I was just mentioning, perhaps not coincidentally. And also, it is interesting that it is these, these sorts of students who are attracted to sociology. Perhaps there's something about sociology that attracts a certain cosmopolitan uh, community, perhaps communities that actually identify with publics that are perhaps more marginal in the world. Well, those are the students. Let me tell you about the course. What are we going to do? Ha ha! We are going to be listening to public sociologists from different countries. Lebanon, Brazil, Colombia, Philippines, France, China, India, Ukraine, Spain, South Africa, and the United States. One from each. They will be talking about their projects, how they bring their sociology to publics, the dilemmas and challenges, the contradictions and frustrations, the successes and failures that they have faced. Each week, there will be another faraway sociologist in conversation with students here in Berkeley. The conversation will be recorded, edited, downloaded, and made available on the ISA website <laughs> and Facebook. There will also be a blog where we'll be posting a few reading materials by sociologists under discussion. But that is just the beginning. This conversation will then be watched and discussed by classes in Lisbon, Sao Paulo, Johannesburg, Oslo, Kiev, Tehran, Tunis, Barcelona, and probably other places. Each partner class will post a short summary of their discussion, of their own discussion of the videos on Facebook, which will then be open for comments from anywhere, from anyone in the world. In this way, we hope to create a global community of sociologists, a network of nodes, bringing sociology to wider audiences at the same time as discussing how to actually accomplish this goal of contacting wider audiences. We will be building the aeroplane as we fly it. A hazardous process indeed. Well, we should begin with a simple question, what is a public? There is no simple, singular, agreed upon definition. But if we are going to talk about public sociology, we should have a point of departure about concerning the idea of public. And we'll come back to this question time and again during the semester. But for now, let me say this. A public can be a social movement, an organization, a group, but always seen from the perspective of it being made up of listeners and speakers. Publics are first and foremost arenas of real and potential communication. Publics can be thick or thin. The communication can be dense or sparse. Publics can be narrow or broad. They can be immediate, narrow uh, neighborhood associations. It can also be, publics can be of a national character. 
perhaps the readership of a national newspaper. Publics can be active or passive. They can, in fact, not know one another. They can be passive like a readership of a newspaper, but they can also be active like a social movement. And publics can be mainstream or oppositional. Well, just as publics are very diverse, so is public sociology. But what all public sociologists share is their communication with publics beyond the academy, which implies a complex double communication, a communication among members of a public themselves in communication with sociologists. Publics have an internal conversation even as they are in conversation with sociologists. That is the core of the idea of public sociology. That communication or conversation between sociologists and public can be of two forms. A mediated conversation, or what I call traditional public sociology. This is the sociologist entering into conversation with publics through newspapers, through op-ed pieces, through television channels, through interviews on radio, through blogs, through books that are widely read. That is the call, the traditional public sociologist, as opposed to the organic public sociologist who has an unmediated relationship to publics, and face-to-face, -face, if you will, a face-to-face -face relationship with publics. These are the sociologists who are working in the trenches of civil society, with trade unions, social movements, with neighborhood associations, with religious organizations, entering into a conversation with them that is direct and unmediated. So there are these two types of public sociology, traditional and organic. And we will see through the semester how our different public sociologists fit one or other of these modes. Now, you might think there's all this public sociology. What's the fuss? This is pretty uncontroversial, right? Right, Dave? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, what's you know, obviously Sociologists would want their ideas to be disseminated to publics beyond the academy. And yet, public sociology has been proven to be extraordinarily controversial. My colleagues, my department, are very disapproving, or some of them are disapproving of the idea of public sociology. There have been, perhaps, 20 or more symposia debating whether well, public sociology is a good idea, what it means, how it should be done, its dangers, dilemmas. It's been very controversial. And these symposia have taken place all over the world. So, to understand why there should be so much controversy, we have to understand the relationship of public sociology to the rest of sociology. And that is what I tend to do in the, the remainder of my time, which is how much have I got? Uh, 10, 15. 15, okay, <laughs> okay, 15. <laughs> well, there's a hard bargain. But anyway, all right, 15 minutes to explain the academic division of labor. Okay, let us start, <laughs> let us start, let us start with public sociology. Public sociology. And I hope you can read this. And if you can't, as I tell to my students, just the very effort trying to read it will keep you awake. Public sociology. Of course, there's organic and traditional forms. And the idea is that sociology here is in close connection with publics. It's accessible to publics and accountable to publics. This has to be first and foremost contrasted with what? With per per Professional sociology, absolutely. Professional sociology. And is sociology talking, sociology talking to whom? To sociologists. Very good. This is sociologists doing research in research programs and being evaluated by fellow sociologists, peer review. And often this sociology is incomprehensible to those who are not sociologists. Indeed, sometimes incomprehensible to sociologists themselves. And it is therefore in tension with public sociology, which has to be accessible to publics. So here we have professional scientific sociology developing, and it is a necessary part of 
an input into public sociology because public sociology is, after all, sociology. If, it's, if there isn't that connection, then it's not really sociology. But at the same time, there is the tension between the two as one is accountable to peers, the other accountable to publics. So, there is an interdependent relationship. Professional depends, in my view, upon the public sociology, infuses challenges into professional sociology. At the same time, the public sociology depends upon the professional. It's an antagonistic interdependence. But that is not all there is in the academic division of labor. There is also something called policy sociology, policy science. This is the sociologist who has actually got something to offer to a client. A sociologist who is there to solve a problem defiant by a client. You know, the mayor of Oakland is very worried about the Occupy movement. It's by employing some sociologists to figure out how to regulate the Occupy movement. Sociologists are very good at thinking of ways of absorbing dissent. Okay, so there is a possibility of policy sociologists actually, in a sense, serving clients, and often, in return, they get some payment. It's a sort of contractual relationship. It's not a conversation, it's a relationship of subservience to a client. Now, sometimes, of course, that subservience is, has, involves more autonomy. And there have been some wonderful policy sociologists who've done excellent work in, for example, areas of education, um, in areas of poverty, um, in areas of race relations, but anyway, it's of a different relationship. There is, however, as you can see, sociologists, they love two by two tables. <laughs> that is the mark of, well, at least the yeah, US sociologists. Can you construct a two by two table? Well, that means I've got to have a fourth box, and the fourth box is indeed occupied by what I call critical sociology. Critical sociology is a sociology that examines the foundations of professional sociology that examines the methodological assumptions, the theoretical assumptions, and the value foundations of professional sociology. Lays bare what the professional sociologist doesn't want to really contemplate because he or she wants to get on with the science. And to do that has to make certain assumptions. And doesn't like the critical sociologists are always sort of biting at their heels questioning the foundations of the professional so revealing those foundations. But the critical sociologist is an important input into professional sociology, moving it at different ways in different times. So the critical sociologist is the sociologist who's engaged with other sociologists in talking about the foundations of sociology. So there are my two, my two by two table, my four types of sociology. We have to give these, this table dimensions. The dimensions are what? Well, here we have an academic audience, an academic audience, academic audience. Professional sociologists and critical sociologists are talking to other academics. And here we have an extra academic audience. OK. The policy talking to the client, the public sociology talking to publics. Now, along this dimension is more tricky. I make a distinction here between what I call instrumental knowledge. Oh, the professional sociologists hate me for calling their type of knowledge instrumental. But what I'm trying to indicate with this instrumental type of knowledge is knowledge that is concerned with means for given ends. Here we are solving problems defined by clients, and here we are solving puzzles defined by the research program which is taken for granted, the scientific program that is taken for granted, as opposed to reflexive, reflexive, reflexive knowledge which involves a discussion of values and goals, of values and goals. Here we have sociologists talking to one another, discussing with one another the foundations of professional sociology. Here we have the sociologists discussing with publics the foundations, directions, and goals of society. This distinction between instrumental and reflexive knowledge is an old distinction that actually um, made first by, well, not my first, but, by, but in a sort of rather celebrated way by Max Weber and taken up by the Frankfurt School. And what both Weber and the Frankfurt School were concerned with is the disappearance of reflexive knowledge, the disappearance of discussions in society about the direction and goals of society who are increasingly obsessed in modern society with a concern with 
efficient means rather than with the goals. Okay, so very good. We have our dimensions now, but behind these dimensions are two fundamental questions that sociologists, social scientists, scholars, perhaps are too reluctant to pose. Two profound and fundamental questions we have to pose if we want to think about a sociology for today. The first question is, knowledge for whom? Knowledge for whom? Knowledge for whom? Are we talking to academics? Or are we talking to those who are outside the academic world? Knowledge for whom? An academic or an actor? And here we have knowledge for what? Are we concerned with means? Or are we concerned with a discussion of values? So those are the two big questions we cannot avoid. And we must continually be remind ourselves of how important they are. Who are we producing knowledge for and for what end? Is it for looking at means or for discussing goals? So that is my two by two table. And I could talk about this for weeks. But I've only got five minutes. Five minutes. All right. I want to say three things. Three things. First, a flourishing discipline, a flourishing discipline, and this applies to all disciplines in my view, is one in which recognizes all four types of knowledge in a relationship of interdependence. That sociology will be a flourishing discipline if there is a professional, a policy, a public, and a critical in relationship of interdependence. A relationship of interdependence. Antagonistic interdependence, to be sure, but interdependence. We need all four. And insofar <laughs> as any one of these hives off from the others, we are that much the weaker as a discipline. My second point is that, in reality, the relationship among these knowledges is not one of wonderful interde antagonistic interdependence, but is actually also one of domination. That in different countries, in different places, in different historical moments, sociology has a different configuration of these knowledges, different configuration of domination. So, in the United States, the professional sociology is what <coughs> dominates this scheme. And there's always the danger that it will push out of existence the critical and the public. In a country like Brazil, or India, or South Africa, or some European countries, the public sociology is much stronger than it is in this country. Indeed, if you will go to Brazil or South Africa and talk about public sociology, as I have from time to time, they wonder what on earth you're talking about. I mean, all sociology is public. What else would one do it for? Huh? Well, so, in many countries, public sociology is taken for granted, but not necessarily in the United States, where it is controversial because the professionals feel threatened in some way by public sociology, which they claim is going to politicize the discipline. It's going to suggest that we are not a pure science. It's going to delegitimate and discredit the discipline. And the policy sociologists are also worried that public sociology will actually make sociology look like a, some, some form of activism or something that will, in a sense, delegitimate their scientific access, their access based on science to the cli clients. So, so, you see in different countries. So, you might say in, in the Soviet Union, the policy sociology was very dominant. Essentially, sociology was, a, was basically an instrument of was an ideological instrument of the party state. And to this day, in post-Soviet Russia, a lot of sociology is still very policy-oriented. Now, in a sense, in, in the service of corporations or politicians, they, sociologists spend a lot of time doing survey research um, for their clients. Yeah. And actually, interestingly enough, you might say in Scandinavian countries, policy sociology is quite strong because of the connection of sociology to a welfare state. 
Finally, critical sociology. I don't know. I, can, I don't know where, where one can say in what sort of countries there is a powerful critical sociology. One might say in societies where sociology is very weak, where there is an authoritarian regime that does not allow the development of civil society. Um, there, in those circumstances, a critical soci underground critical sociology may appear, such as in the Soviet era in Eastern Europe. They say, though, the French are very critical, so perhaps one might argue that, you know, critical sociology is strong in France. But anyway, my point is that the articulation of these different knowledges looks very different in different, discipline, in different, different countries, in different times. Okay, I know. I'm moving to my third point. My third point. I've talked about different types of knowledge, professional, policy, public, critical. But we should now say something a little bit about this, not sociology, but the sociologists, the people. Now, any given sociologist may specialize in one of these four, or may in fact find him or herself in more than one of these quadrants, combining the professional and the critical. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you're a professional sociologist, and Tuesdays and Thursdays, you're a critical sociologist. <laughs> Possible. So you can combine. You can combine these different types of knowledge. But you know, we only have 24 hours a day and it's very difficult to combine all four. So we tend to specialize. It's fascinating, actually, if you go to the Global South, sociologists in the Global South tend to have to, by virtue of the pressures upon them, they tend to have to actually um, combine these four all the time. I, I'm, I'm, I, I liken them sometimes to a windmill because they are continually having to actually move between these four. Whereas in the United States, for example, we have the luxury, or sociologists like myself have the luxury of actually specializing as professional. And one can say, one can argue that, um, one can argue that sociologists also have careers through these quadrants. And let me just very briefly, very quickly, because Lali wants me to wrap up. Uh, let me very quickly um, give you uh, a thumbnail sketch of my career and how I moved through these boxes. I began up here as a policy sociologist, working for a co large multinational uh, mining corporation in Zambia as a sort of backroom boy in a personnel research unit, helping them uh, generate a job evaluation scheme. So that was my sort of policy moment. But behind that policy moment, behind that policy moment was a public moment. Because I was actually interested, why was I employed in this multinational corporation? Because I was interested in what was happening to the racial order in the mining industry. And to what extent in post-colonial Zambia, 68 to 72, to what extent race was being reproduced in the post-colonial order. The very antithesis of the project and the program of, of post-colonial Zambia. So, I produced this book called The Color of Class, and it was all about the way in which uh, the color bar in, uh, in Zambia was actually being reproduced in post-colonial era. And so I produced this, 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 this research report, and I published it, and it became subject to a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, and, and it was really my first and perhaps Perhaps the most significant form of public sociology I ever did. Interestingly enough, I got cold feet because what I saw is that you produce a report, you produce a report and you never know quite know what's going to happen to it. And it is in the powers that be in society that can actually determine how it's going to be put, to, to what end it's going to be put. And the multinational corporations got hold of this report and used it for their own ends. And so I began to be a little bit skeptical of the possibility of public sociology. One loses control of the knowledge one produces. And so I left Zambia and went to the University of Chicago, be, did my PhD. And, but with my Marxism that I had picked up in Zambia, I became a critical sociologist, very critical of the mainstream sociology that I was being fed by my professors at the University of Chicago. So there I was, this critical sociologist in the University of Chicago. And then slowly, but sort of the critical sociology, the Marxism of the 1970s, 
became actually accepted in the discipline. And I would, in a sense, mainstreamed. The ideas that I had were being actually consumed and read by graduate students um, in different places in the, in, in the country. So I became, in a sense, a professional sociologist. So here I go. Whoa, and I end up here. And eventually I even became voted in as the president of the American Sociological Association. And one has to be a professional sociologist, I think, <laughs> to achieve such heights. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So here, so that's my, that's my <laughs> career through these different types of sociology. And where am I now? Well, I'm here. You can see me. I'm right in the middle. Here I am. I am here now trying to promote a vision of the discipline that involves all four types of knowledge. All four types of knowledge. And the result is that everybody hates me. <laughs> everybody criticizes me from every one of these boxes. The public sociologists think I've sold out. The professional sociologists think I'm too radical. The critical sociologists think, you know, that I've lost all sense of critique. And the policy sociologists think I am destroying the very foundations of their policy science. But it's great because we are now having a debate in the discipline of sociology about the character of sociology. And at the center of that debate is indeed public sociology, which is what this course is all about. So I'm now going to conclude. So let me conclude. What I have done today is present to you a broad understanding of public sociology. I have tried to locate public sociology in relation to three other types of sociology, professional, policy, and critical. Together they form what I call the disciplinary division of labor. And indeed, the division into four knowledges can be applied, in my view, to any discipline. I have also suggested that just as public sociology looks different in different countries, so does the articulation of those four knowledges look different in different countries. But this is an inward look at sociology. And public sociology, however, looked outwards to publics. To understand public sociology, we have to understand the context within which it engages with publics. We have to understand the world of communication in which sociology competes with so many other sources of information, many supported by wealthy corporations or controlled by states, each with their own interests. Public sociology operates, therefore, on a very uneven terrain, on a terrain of unequal power. Therefore, to understand the possibilities and challenges of public sociology, we need a theory of communication and power in the information age. And there is no better person in the world, no whether sociologist or non-sociologist, no better person to provide such a theory than Manuel Castells, who will indeed be with us next week. So, thank you very much. Okay. All right. So, thank you, Michael. So, you, this this class is about public sociology, but it also is is itself our. It's an effort to kind of exemplify public sociology in the sense that here we're having a conversation both amongst ourselves but also with these people in parallel courses all over the world and through that conversation kind of constituting ourselves as this you know global public of, of public sociologists. Um, so we want to begin that conversation today and open up discussion um, first with our own students here. So anybody want to kind of begin and, and share their thoughts or any thoughts or questions about this? Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, you describe organic, uh, organic sociology as having a conversation with the public and the public engaging back with the sociologist. But being seen as a sociologist or as, or as a researcher already puts you in a position of dominance. How, how, do, uh, how do us as sociologists and researchers, how do we stop this, stop ourselves from exerting dominance and taking over the conversation with the public? and allowing the public to actually have a voice? Yeah. Ah, well, that's a pretty difficult first question. Yes, indeed. I think that is a problem. See, this organic public sociology is indeed is a balanced relationship of mutuality, reciprocity, in which each, the, the public, 
genuinely has a conversation about its own views of the world with the sociologists who has, or sociologists who have their own, also their own views, their sociological perspective. How can one have a balanced conversation? That's the question. And it's indeed incredibly difficult to actually execute such a balanced conversation. But what is important is that one has that as a goal, even if one doesn't always achieve it. And you should be aware that it's not always that the sociologist dominates the public. Often the public dominates the sociologist. Um, it's as often the case that publics really constrain the way the sociologist can actually have a conversation with them. So if you are working perhaps with trade unions in England and they're concerned with one thing only, they're concerned to keep their jobs. Your vision of an alternative type of society has to go by the board because they're not interested in that. So it's a very difficult process to maintain this autonomy on the one hand and to resist the domination. But at least we have a goal in mind. At least we have a goal in mind. And we should collectively engage in evaluating what we do all the time. And it should be a single sociologist going out there in the trenches. We should be always working together collectively to see in what ways we can actually restore that balance. Yeah. Good. Mike. Um, yeah, well, speaking of goals, you, you differentiate between like means and ends based sociology, and that implies that there is a goal. So I was wondering is there one goal that unites these four uh -huh. disciplines? Uh -huh. Or uh -huh. the way you've divided it up? Is there one uh -huh. thing essentially uh -huh. that defines them that they all agree upon? Uh -huh. Is there one thing that defines all those knowledges as sociological? Or do they have a common goal? Yes. Well, that's a very interesting question. It, would, it takes a non-sociologist like yourself to ask that question. Indeed, I think it's very important. I mean, we do have discussions about what is sociology, what would unite all those four types of knowledge. My own view is that sociology takes the standpoint of civil society, political science the standpoint of the state, and economics the standpoint of the economy. But not all sociologists will agree on that. And so... Many, almost as, there are many different notions of sociology as there are sociologists. So there's an interesting question of whether, well, to what extent, this discussion we are having now about our discipline can lead us to a consensual view. But all I can give you, in a sense, is my view of what sociology is. Sociology really is the standpoint of civil society, those organizations, institutions, movements that are neither part of the state nor part of the economy. And we look at the world from the standpoint of that civil society. A world that is actually, the civil society these days is actually under threat from market and state, as I was suggesting. And so we are in a sense, so, or not only are we sociologists taking the standpoint of civil society, but we are also in a sense in the process of defending civil society because that is indeed our foundational, that's our base. So it's very important that we do defend it. But yes, I think it's a good question, and perhaps we will come back to that. Perhaps you should ask all uh, the successive uh, seminar leaders what they think sociology is about. But yes, but I think it's a very good question. What actually makes all this sociological knowledge? These are four types of sociological knowledge. Good. Yes. Julian. Uh, you claim there's a synergy and mutual dependence between public and professional sociology. I was just wondering if you believe that because social is funded at uh, times by the state and market forces, if uh, it biases professional sociology and therefore also public sociology. Uh, funding by the state, what effect that has on sociology? Uh, well, do you want to follow up? All right. Uh -huh. well, in the, my question to that, like, in the context of the U.S. society, how do we break away from the domination of professional sociology? Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. reaching public sociology? Okay, all right. That's two slightly different questions. But yes. I mean, where the state actually funds sociology, you have great difficulty in gaining the autonomy necessary for professional sociology. In the Soviet Union, it was very difficult to establish an autonomous professional sociology because it was basically regulated, controlled, and funded by the state, the party state. And indeed, today in Soviet Union, a lot of, in post Soviet Russia, a lot of the research is funded by. Not necessarily the state, though the state does indeed fund quite a lot of research, but also um, political parties, politicians, corporations. So that means it's 
policy is very strong. And the problem for many sociologists then is how do we establish a professional sociology that could be a foundation of policy sociology? How can we establish this autonomous professional sociology, relative autonomous professionals? You know, in Russia today, what they say, my colleague Lena Zdrava Misleva says, public sociology in Russia today is the public defense of an autonomous professional sociology publicly defending an autonomous professional sociology. So indeed, we have, to, we have to actually be very careful in trying to establish an arena of autonomy for professional, otherwise we don't have any of that sociology that will infuse the public and the policy world. That's right, yes. So that's, that's the challenge. Now Naomi's um, uh, question about the the professional dominating the public. Here we talk, before we're talking about the dominance of the policy, she was asking about the professional dominating the public. How can we somehow, in this country in particular, somehow rescue a space for public sociology? Indeed. Indeed. Well, that's what we're trying to do, of course, in this course. And there are other places in, in the country that are having courses in public sociology. And we have to, in a sense, begin to try and incentivize and to demonstrate to the professional sociologists that they too have an interest in a vibrant public sociology. In many countries, actually, the professional sociology only really um, is, 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 is actually going to be dependent upon the public legitimacy of sociology, and therefore public sociology is very important. But in this country, it is independently funded, um, in a sense that it provides, it provides a disciplinary basic it provi you know, the funding of sociology in this country largely comes from whom? The many students who take sociology courses. That's, that's a, a large... Uh, there is funding from the state, but the professional actually is autonomous because it is an accepted discipline in the university. But it is, it is an issue. How can one build an autonomous public... Service? That is a question that we will, of course, be addressing throughout the semester. How to build a public sociology. Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about how your work was appropriated by... Wait, wait, wait. Stop. We're almost there. All we need is like <laughs> five more minutes of questions, two more questions, and we got it. We're almost there. Oh, yeah. It's going to take a minute. Oh. Thank you. Yay! He's, he's, he's gone, right? He's, uh, he's coming. Right there. He's coming. Ah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that was an easy. That'll be an easy cut. All right. All right. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. Thank you. It's you. I mean, it's you. We start with your question. Okay. Um, you talked about a little bit. You talked about how your work was was appropriated by like corporations, and I was wondering. What do you think public sociologists can do to protect um, their research and protect their and protect the public and sort of gain some control over how their information is being used? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, perhaps Manuel Castells will have something to say about this. <laughs> but let me say about that, that particular study I did in Zambia. It was a form of what I would call traditional public. I produced a report. I thought, well, produce a report, tell the truth. You know, race has been reproduced in post-colonial Zambia. Hunky-dory, and then somehow things will get better. I was very young. Um, and in fact, once you put something else out in the, in the public sphere like that, who knows what's going to happen to it. So my reflection now would be that perhaps I should have been an organic public sociologist. That is, I, should have had, I would have had more control over what happens to the knowledge if I had been built a close relationship, for example, with the personnel officers, on the, the, the uh, Zambian personnel officers on the mines, or with the workers. I had chosen a public to actually collaborate with. And perhaps I would have a little bit more control. I would have much more control. And the visibility, of course, of the public sociology would be less. But at least I would have a more, uh, a, a, a more collaborative relationship with publics whose interests uh, I thought were important. Yeah. yeah um, so I was wondering, how do we deal with publics that may be invisible? And how then do we tap into those publics? Yeah. Yeah, that's very difficult. How do we deal with publics that are invisible? You know, I. I think I would like to answer that question 
by talking about the way sociologists, not just sociologists, journalists too, and other social scientists, constituted a public which we all now recognize. The public is called women. Right? Or indeed, we could talk about the public, the gay community. These are publics that have indeed been constituted, and I think sociologists have played a role in that constitution. So I think our theoretical frameworks often lead us to anticipate the existence of publics that are invisible and might then lead us to engage and constitute those publics. We have now a sociology of gender. We didn't really have a sociology of gender in the 1950s and 60s. We had a family sociology, but not a sociology of gender. We now have a sociology of sexuality. So the, 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 the sociologists can play a very important role in so far as their constitution of publics um, uh, becomes public, if the categories they, they use become, in a sense, public categories. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for one last question. Yeah. So, would this actually mean that debate is not enough in the sense that there, need, there is need for some social action that public sociology stimulates? To, to actually create a public, you mean? Yeah, create a public and also like make the invisible visible. <laughs> Uh, Let's just keep going. Yeah, keep going? Yeah, sorry. So what I mean is also just with what you ask about, to make the invisible visible, uh, there needs to be some kind of change, right. either right. in the field or... Right, well I think it involves, it will involve sociologists actually partaking in shaping organizations, movements that actually center the, the new category. It may not be the sociologist who actually partakes in that movement, but the sociologist can provide an understanding of why the particular category is an important category in shaping our understanding of society. Yes, so in the end, publics don't just... Sociologists don't just speak women and suddenly women appear. Mm -hmm. But they can provide sort of a necessary, a necessary framework, a necessary way of thinking, a necessary, if you wish, ideology that um, actually provides the foundations for others to, to grasp hold of it. It's, and it then becomes a relationship between sociologists and an emergent movement. Yeah. Thank you. So sadly, we don't have time left, but we're going to continue this next week when Manuel Castells is here with us um, to talk about his theory of, of communication and power and its implications for public sociology. Um, so let's thank Michael for starting us off. Thank you all. Okay.